I'm uh, Dave Ingram. I'm a senior operations uh, guy at DataCF now. Um, quick plug, we're hiring. We're an awesome company. Um, come talk to myself or some of my colleagues are also around at the conference. Um, before that, I also worked for a company called Group Spaces for um, a good few years. I have way too many projects. I've got so many things on the go at once. Um, it's difficult to balance, but I'm involved in open source. I've got involved with uh, Joined In, among other projects. Um, and if you want to, uh, to talk to me, uh, to heckle me or ask questions, then hit uh, DMI on Twitter. Nice, short, and easy to remember. So, um, why am I giving this talk? I've built quite a few APIs. Um, unfortunately, most of them are not public, um, so I, I can't brag about them. Um, but I've consumed a lot of APIs, and I've seen what happens uh, when people try to build them without really thinking it through to begin with. Um, also, I'm, I'm very opinionated, um, as I'm sure you'll find out. So, if you, as I said, if you want to give me any feedback afterwards, that's fantastic. I will be responding to each and every tweet. Uh, and also, if you could leave some feedback on Joined In, um, that will also be wonderful. Uh, and just help me make sure that, that uh, this can all improve uh, if it needs to. So, what this talk isn't about um, is REST. A lot of people talk about it, and that's, that's not what I'm going to do. I mean, it's great and all, but there's so much more to building an API than just having you know, like your good URL design, uh, using the right verbs. You've also got to care about things like uh, the headers that you accept and that you, um, that you give back, the authentication, the data formats, data integrity, and documentation. Yes, I did say documentation, but we'll come back to that later. So very, very quickly, I'm going to rush through what most REST talks tend to cover, which is good URL design. Um, my advice on this is to make them versioned, uh, to make them mean, uh, hackable and meaningful, uh, so that there's a sense of structure and a sort of a natural feel to them. So something really simple, just you know, V1 for the very first version, um, a collection of users, a particular user and then attributes relating to them. And building up in a structure that makes sense, but from a consumer perspective, they don't care how you've built things. They don't care if it's really difficult or really complex or really expensive for you to calculate stuff. They just want to use it in a way that makes sense to them from what they can see on the outside. So use your common sense. It's, um, and you've got to so sort of try and take a step back and consider how it's going to seem with, if you don't have all this deep knowledge about the system. One of the things that um, I see said about uh, APIs from time to time, um, less so now, fortunately, is people throwing everything in the URL. That's not quite what it's for. So you don't have, for example, my API slash search slash term one slash term two. That's what the query string is for. That's what it's designed to be used for. So it's for filtering um, and maybe some um, alternate representation um, and flags, useful things like that. So you'd use it for, uh, for example, for controlling verbosity. You don't use it for saying, oh, I want XML or I want JSON. There are more semantic ways of doing that. You can use it with uh, file extensions or headers, but I'll come back to that later. So just for example, the, the search I mentioned earlier, um, you want to, to make sure you're using the right tools for the job. Uh, and again, with JSON, uh, sorry, with formats, you can use um, file extensions um, or uh, an accept header. Um, but there, there are pros and cons. Verbs, again, um, HTTP has quite a few. Only two of them are used a lot, uh, which is get and, put, uh, get and post. Um, head often uh, also comes up occasionally, um, and as I'm sure you all know, uh, put and delete um, are also useful. Options kind of comes into it a bit, um, and that's going to become more and more popular in the near future. Um, but I find it helpful to think of things in terms of um, operating on, on a data model. Um, as you can see there, I'm not going to go through it all. Um, but you. Unless you're building a read-only API, um, like, say, Google+, because you know, they don't want anyone to post, you must handle get and post. Um, they're the two basic operations. And all clients can handle those. Uh, 
um, no matter like, sort of how limited they are. With the other methods, you can um, emulate those if necessary. So you still keep the semantics, but still support clients that are really limited. Um, so one example I've seen that I quite like for doing this is to have um, an exclamation mark and then the desired method name at the end, and to use post um, for, sort of for forcing that through. And that's from a semantic point of view, because post requests um, are defined to have side effects, and so they don't get cached. Um, they'll ask the user if you want to, um, if you're doing it in a browser, if you want to retry the request, and so on. Um, but one thing to remember is that put and delete should have the same effect no matter how many times they're repeated. So if, you, uh, if somebody um, sends a delete message to a particular endpoint, then that should delete the, the required object, obviously, but return success even if they do it multiple times in a row, because it's not going to be any more deleted, it's already gone. Uh, and a similar thing with put, um, you, you're just updating a resource, you're overwriting it. Um, heads is, is fairly rare, and PHP will generally deal with that for you. Um, you can detect it to uh, decide to do less work and less processing, but depending on what you're doing, that might not be, be feasible or useful. And options is very rare until fairly recently with the advent of cores. So this is something called uh, cross-origin resource sharing. Uh, and that's a kind of grand term for getting around the uh, same origin uh, restriction in browsers. So with a browser, you can only send a request to the same domain um, that you got the original page from. If you want to go outside of that, then usually you're, you're stuffed. Um, but with this standard, uh, which works in all uh, major browsers um, of recent version, uh, it's Works properly in IE 10 plus. It doesn't. It's not quite the same in lower versions of IE. It's a different, um, a different object. But normally you won't have to care about that. There are wrappers around everything. Um, but it allows you to um, send. A, it sends a couple of extra headers. So uh, origin and allow origin, and then the API server can then decide. Yes, I'm going to allow this request, um, or no. You know, nobody else is allowed to to query the server um, from anywhere else. Um, this brings me very nicely onto the, the topic of headers. So, they're very important things um, to consider. They're not just sort of a sort of a, th a throwaway addition. You can actually do a lot that makes that can make your API a lot more clever, and make people enjoy using it a lot more, um, because things just kind of act automatically. So, a couple of examples are the accept header, um, which you can use for saying. OK, this client can only handle, I don't know, PNG and not JPEG. Um, and then if the server's clever enough, it can then re uh, return resources in the right format or transcode them on the fly. This can be important with video, uh, for example. So if clients uh, can only support a few types, um, that's a good way of, of negotiating that without having to explicitly make them say, I want you know, uh, MPEG-4 with these type of options. Uh, and accept language as well um, is useful for deciding how to return responses that can be seen by the users. Um, so if you've got any error messages that you're returning from your API that users will end up seeing or may end up seeing, um, then it's useful to be able to localize that in a way that you, you, know, you don't have to keep asking the client. Most of them will provide that header automatically. Um, also important for mobile, there are a lot of headers that you can use to, to reduce uh, the overall traffic um, going back and forth, and also to uh, reduce the work that you guys have to do. So there's a whole set of them. Um, etag and if none match kind of go uh, are paired together. Uh, that an etag comes from the server side, uh, and it just represents uh, it's like a, a, um, a short text string that can be absolutely anything you like, but it uniquely identifies that version of that resource. Um, and then the if, uh, the if match headers can be used to say, only do process this request if it has changed or hasn't changed since last time we saw it. Uh, similar thing with modified since and last modified dates. Um, and also, don't neglect the cache control headers. Um, if you can push a lot of the work downstream towards your clients, 
so it's not hitting your server as much, then you don't need as much uh, need to do as much work. Um, one other one, uh, one other header that gets mentioned fairly little is the vary header. Uh, this is very useful if you're using um, like varnish internally. Uh, you can say you can provide your own sort of extra headers that then get stripped out, but use that for caching the requests um, and for caching just sections and saying this bit varies depending on the user or depending on a cookie or depending on some other header. Um, this is all well and good using headers and so on, but uh, it does come with a couple of problems. So not all, um, not all clients can use all headers. If you use your own extended headers, then there is a chance that um, corporate proxies will get in the way and will discard them completely because they have a whitelist um, or a particular blacklist. Or they'll just strip anything beginning with x dash. Um, also, not even standard headers are safe. Um, so it has been the case where some um, uh, particular corporate proxies have stripped out things like the accept header. So yes, you can use them, and yes, they're, they're helpful, but have fallback methods just in case. All right, authentication and authorization. This is a bit of a sticky topic. Um, there are lots of different ways of doing this, and some people tend to roll their own. Um, which is not, again, not so common anymore because a lot of people use OAuth2 over HTTPS, which is, let's be fair, a pretty good solution. Um, it's simpler from the implementation side than OAuth1. Um, there's less work to do, less things that can go wrong, and it kind of acts a bit like a session cookie, um, just for a, a fairly long-lived session. Um, it does mean that it has the uh, the insecurities that come with that as well. So if anybody get, gets hold of the token, there's nothing to stop them impersonating that user and that application. Uh, there are a lot of existing libraries for it, and many of them are quite mature now um, for all sorts of different platforms. So the, all the mobile platforms and all the different um, server-side languages for both the client and server implementations. So it's not generally a worry for people implementing against it. It's just a case of drop in this library, give it these options, and you're done. Um, there is an extension called uh, Oath to HMAC, which uses uh, signatures kind of in a similar way to uh, Oath one. And so requests are signed. They can't be repeated. And um, they don't give away the, the client secrets. But that's not used very often uh, in, in the real world so far. Um, if it's a security critical thing, then yes, I'd advise it. But generally, you will be doing this over HTTPS anyway. Um, or if you're not, you really, really should. Uh, and that should be good enough security. Uh, having said all this, the um, original author of the Oath 2 spec has said that it's become a bit of a corporate infight. And it's not really suited to corporations, it's not really suited to normal users. So his, his official advice is to only use it if you follow an existing provider very closely, um, or if you know a lot about the security, uh, or if you've already started implementing it. If, on the other hand, you're about to start something new, he said you might as well use OAuth1 because it's well known, well understood. Um, yeah, this kind of fits in here, I guess. Um, I've had questions in the past about rate limiting and things like, what point should I care about limiting people using my API? And, and how do you go about this? Generally, when you're starting out, you're not going to have very many users. And so you can afford to get by without limiting, um, unless it's a sort of a, a massive launch that's been sort of eagerly awaited. Um, and so you can get, start to get a feel of what sensible limits should be. Um, and you can do you sort of react fairly manually to it. Um, there are some drop-in solutions. Uh, so Axel is one that I've, I've heard use quite well. Uh, sorry, API Axel. Um, Threescale and um, Mashery also provide uh, layers that sort of sit in the middle um, to, to help manage both the authentication of clients and also the, um, the rate limiting and, and uh, handling all of that so you don't have to worry. Um, but yeah, generally it's, it shouldn't be much of a problem, especially in the early days. It's only once you get big or if you're charging for use of your API that you need to worry about that. Uh, data formats. Um, 
there's a lot of discussion about XML versus JSON and yeah, what people prefer. And I'm going to be, I show off my opinions here and say that JSON is the one true way. Um, XML is, is great for, what, for you know, like the corporate style of, of customers, in my opinion, and sort of the enterprise thing. But um, it's very verbose, it repeats itself a lot, um, and uh, it, it can be a bit of a pain to work with. Um, but one of the key things is to, to have is not just to return the response, but include out-of-band data as well. So being able to include out-of-band data, like, uh, out data like this is very, very useful, especially for uh, systems that have notifications. So instead of having the client continually ping you and say, do I have any more notifications? Do I have any more notifications to show the user? Um, you can send it uh, sort of uh, beside all the normal responses and say, you know, yes, by the way, while you're at it, here's some new stuff that's happened without having to uh, set up and configure any type of, um, say, cloud to device messaging. Uh, it also lets you use JSONP, um, which, because it's just loading a script tag, if the server returns an error code, uh, an HTTP error, then the script will just fail to load, won't get parsed, and won't run. So what you have to do is to return success and then add the, uh, the actual status code, um, you know, failure or whatever it might be, in a meta block alongside it. Um, it also gives you a place to put things like deprecation information. So if uh, a particular API is going away soon or changing, you can add developer notes there. Uh, you can also use it for rate limit information as well to make it easy to parse and easy to extract. Um, yeah, so I've been through all of that. So what about XML? Again, everything you can do with JSON, you can do with XML, and yeah, arguably you can do a lot more. Um, if it's the sort of thing that's required um, for your particular application, then go for it, go wild. If you're just going to include it as an option, um, I would advise just sticking to one data format uh, because it'll make your life a lot easier. Um, unless you're starting to get a lot of requests from other people saying, hey, what about, yeah, what about this? Um, most uh, consumers and uh, all, most systems will have very good, very mature, fast and efficient JSON parsing libraries. So it's one less thing to worry about. Uh, something else that gets uh, bandied about with, uh, with REST is um, hypertext is the engine of application state. And this is very, uh, basically a l very long way of saying that you include the links to what you can do next in the response. Um, personally, I'm not a fan of it. Uh, it is useful to people who are building um, API explorers. For, um, so they can get, um, so you can show useful information to the, you know, to the consumer and say, these are the kind of things that can happen. So if you're going through a shopping cart process, um, you'd have, you sort of adding items to the cart with um, endpoint would then return your response that gives you links to um, the, the beginnings of the checkout process. Uh, so you can just sort of follow those through and you don't have to build the URLs and, and things yourself. You just have a single entry point. Um, it has its advantages and disadvantages, but most of the time, I'd argue, you're not going to need it. Um, and also, don't forget, mobile browsers uh, and mobile clients do have limited bandwidth still. Uh, many people may not use uh, 3G connections or may not have them available. And so you've got to be conservative with the amount of data you have. If people build their clients well, they will support um, gzip encoding. So it's less of an issue. But that's not always the case, and you can't guarantee people are going to build good clients. Uh, a quick word about timestamps. Um, there's a, a, a divide here between making your uh, API readable um, to normal, normal people, normal humans trying to decode it, and against making it very useful for the, um, the clients to, to handle. Having a date in uh, an ISO style format looks very nice and it's easy for somebody to understand and you know, you're embedding the time zone information and so on. But it's extra work for the client to actually end up decoding it. Um, what's a lot easier for, for them to deal with is just a simple numeric um, you know, second since epoch. And if you do need time zone information as well, then you can add that into the response. 
Um, but yeah, usually it's um, it's not. It will be shown in the local time zone of the, of the user. Um, so yes, I don't think human readability is essential um, if it sacrifices um, convenience and efficiency from the machine parsing side. Okay, data integrity. Um, this is kind of weird, a bit of a weird title for this section, but I'm going to just cover a lot of stuff to do with um, the, the data that you're passing back and forth. So one of the important things is to make sure that your consumers, uh, to make it as easy for your consumers to cache the data as you can, because the less times they're hitting your server, the less work you're doing, the less money you need to spend in order to, to get it done, and the less uh, you have to worry about efficiency. So just using the, the simple standard headers, um, as I mentioned earlier, the if modified since and if none match uh, will only return a response if the, um, the data has changed, um, either in what, it's, what it contains for the none match or um, when it was last updated. And a similar thing with put, post, put, and delete, you can say only do these if the resource is what I knew it to be before. And this is something you can then uh, use in uh, conflict uh, detection, which I'll go through in just a second. But um, so you need to return the, the relevant response headers to make this actually useful and, and viable for your consumers. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so you can use uh, HTTP to build preconditions about the response to help with data safety and to help make sure that people don't stomp over each other's changes. So there are a whole set of status codes that are uh, useful to, to know about. Uh, 405 um, is basically you tried to get from a post-only endpoint or similar, um, and you should return a list, or I think must return a list of allowable uh, verbs for that endpoint. Um, 406 is just I can't give you any kind of um, any content type that you'll accept, uh, so yeah, uh, either relax that or, or go somewhere else. 412 and 428 um, allow you to, um, again, to stop people stomping over each other's changes. And there is an official status code for, for too many requests. Um, for, so if, if you've uh, throttled somebody, rate limited them. So stopping race conditions. And say you have a wiki, and um, somebody is trying to update it. They're just sending, in the simplest case, some HTML content back um, to update this page. If they haven't included any of the conflict resolution headers, it's perfectly acceptable for you to, to you know, essentially to sell them off and say, no, don't do that. Um, I'm not going to listen until you can prove to me that you at least know what the, what the response was originally um, and that you, you would, uh, would care about any changes. So um, what you do is you add uh, the if modified, uh, unmodified since and if match headers and the e tag itself can be anything at all. Um, so in this case, it's useful to have it just as a, a revision number for the, for the wiki page. And then the server can say, actually, hey, somebody's updated it since. And so I'm not going to let you perform that request. Fetch it again, complain to the user. OK, documentation, everybody's favorite topic. Uh, it's really, really important. I can't overstate how vital good documentation is to adoption of an API. If people can't understand what they're doing with it, what you expect, and how to build against it, they're going to go somewhere else because it's just too much effort for, for them to kick it around. So the key thing there is to use a lot of examples and not to truncate them, to show, them, to show the end users exactly what they're going to see and get when, they, when they're making all of these requests. Um, and not just assume that they will, will fill in the gaps uh, themselves. And with documentation, it is vital to make sure it does actually match the API you've built. It, it does sound like a bit of a silly thing, but it can be very easy for the things you built to get out of sync um, with, with the documentation. So it's not a bad idea to add the documentation examples to your automated tests. So you can then say, oh, right, you know, this has failed. We need to update the docs. Otherwise, people can get very confused. You can't guarantee that people are going to understand that when you say 
at this point we return um, an, an identifier, an ID, and it's an integer that you really mean it's an unsigned 64-bit integer. Um, because people will then just do all sorts of uh, different possibilities. They will then blame you when the, when the application breaks because they used a, a signed 32-bit instead of uh, unsigned 64. Um, so yeah, it could be a, a string, it could be anything. You need to be very explicit and you want to make it as easy as possible for people to just start using this. Um, and there are a lot of uh, documentation tools around um, and interactive consoles. So uh, again, Mashery um, are very good. They've got a, a tool called IODocs. Um, there's uh, Apogee, which do, I think, the Twitter um, API console, um, among many others. And uh, there's Apiary as well, um, which also is quite nice. But finally, um, just to kind of sneak this in, Something that can also slip by the wayside when you're building uh, an API like this is sti uh, statistics. Um, so everybody loves um, yeah, seeing how things are being used. And my advice is it's much better to have numbers for things you don't need than to come across a problem and have no idea where the latency might be or uh, if there's been a sudden spike in connections you need to have all the information you can get so you can make the best decisions you can about uh, capacity planning and um, troubleshooting. And of course, everyone loves graphs. They're great for management, and uh, they're important for getting a, a feel for how the system is working, how it's running, um, and for, for understanding how the performance works best, where the bottlenecks might be. Uh, so just as an exa examples of things to measure, um, have separate counters for each status that you're responding, uh, that you're returning. Because it might be that you're running this API and all of your uh, latency metrics are really, really low. You're returning responses really, really quickly and it sounds fantastic. But none of the customer is getting any data because all you're doing is sending uh, redirection responses instead. If you're not counting and looking for things like that, you might have no easy way of telling. Um, other things like um, client usage is just good to keep an eye on, just for the general health. Um, and things like authentication failures um, can give you a, an idea if somebody's trying to, to break into it uh, or to, to try and break the, the system. Um, when you get to the point of uh, having multiple versions of your API, once something is out, you generally can't change it. Um, it's a bit like extending a class. You can add more stuff but you can't get rid of anything that's already there. Um, so it's useful to keep track of how many people are still using the old version of your API and who exactly that is, so you can start following them up and saying, look, this is going away in you know, three months or whatever now. You really should look at moving. Um, and then yeah, all the other internal things that you should be, should be keeping track of, I hope, um, yeah, like memory usage and disk space, um, DB queries and that sort of thing. I think that's it. So, thank you very much. Um, if you want to uh, leave feedback and join in, I'd really appreciate it. If you have any questions um, that I ran out of time to cover here, please bother me on Twitter, and um, I will be posting slides uh, on joined in as well later on. Thank you. So, any questions? Anybody? Really? I'm surprised. <laughs> Anyone in the other room? Got a question in the other room. Yeah. You mentioned about setting the version of the API in the URL string. Um, where do you stand on doing it using content negotiation? Um, so, uh, using content negotiation for the version of the API, uh, my um, feelings about that is that if you have the API version in the URL, it's possible, uh, it's a lot easier to segment that. So to say, um, all requests for this particular version go to this subset of servers. When you have a new version, you can uh, direct that to, again, another specific subset of servers, uh, and then sort of slowly sunset the other ones. It also makes it easier for the reporting point of view, so you can just quickly look through your logs and without having to make any changes, they will be logging the URL anyway. So you can keep track of, get some, you know, an idea of the overview of how many people are using the different versions. 
Um, but also, again, there's the possibility of really restrictive proxies stripping out the accept header, and so you then lose that version information. Um, so for, for safety's sake and for maximum compatibility, I'd say the URL is the place to go. Cheers. Okay, anybody else? Hello, uh, I've been in the room. Um, just a quick question. You mentioned about the returning of the HTTP status or the status of the request in the meta object. Yeah. Um, where do you sort of draw the line between using the HTTP status code as part of the, you know, the response versus in the, the meta object itself? Like 404, for example, would you return that as metadata or would you just use the normal status code? Sure. So um, the HTTP code should. Um, always be uh, in the meta response, so it's, it's sort of easy to pick up and easy to parse, and so you remain consistent. But if um, I think the only case in which you shouldn't use the official HTTP status code um, in the, the, the header line, of, uh, the um, status line of the response, uh, is if somebody has explicitly requested JSONP. Um, other than that, it should always be, you should always sort of stick to the semantic um, is somatic H uh, HTTP as much as possible. Cool, thanks. Okay. Any more for any more? <laughs> no. All right. Hi, Excellent. I'm in the other room. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is that um, another question in the other room? Sorry. Yeah, you were talking about um, documenting your APIs, um, but you didn't talk much about kind of self-documenting APIs and, and how those can be done with the um, with the other verbs. I was wondering if you could expand on, on how those relate and, and preferences. Uh, sorry, so um, you're asking how, uh, how I would... Um, well, if you can use metadata and, and verbs to kind of automatically document your APIs, yep. um, rather than having to explicitly document them. Yes, so um, if you have good use of, of uh, like good URL design and good verb use, then it's fairly straightforward to see, once you've got a list of, of what's allowed, what it will all do. Um, if uh, the, there are tools, I think, I think Apiary does this, um, where you can just give it a list of the endpoints and the verbs, and it will generate the basic documentation for you. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head which of those it is, but it is one of the, uh, one of the documentation tools. Does that answer your question? That's fine, thank you. Okay. We've got another question. Yeah. yeah. Is it worth pointing out that there's quite a difference between generated documentation and human written documentation? There's kind of space for both of those things. Obviously, the generated stuff is always going to be accurate, but with the human written stuff, you can provide examples, you can provide usage patterns. This is how we advise you use this. This is what we, th we think you can do with our APIs which you're never going to be able to generate. And there's always a value. Yes, no, that, that is a good point. Uh, but the, having the documentation automatically generated to begin with is uh, better than nothing at all. Uh, so at least you have something for each endpoint. But yes, having everything um, custom built or you know, custom written by an actual person is obviously going to be a lot better and a lot more understandable. One more question? Yeah. Still regarding the documentation, um, you mentioned that you, you we should add uh, documentation validation on the automated tests. Could you expand a little bit on that, please? Uh, sure. So one of the um, the useful things that uh, I've done um, with a, uh, an internal API, which I don't think has made it public yet. Um, for for group spaces um, was that we had some internal tests which would um, run uh, mock requests uh, against that API, and all of the data for those came from the documentation. So the documentation listed everything, including um, the headers for both the request and the response, and then there was just something which would pass through that documentation, looking for. Um, it was the documentation had been sort of marked up beforehand, and then it would just look through the documentation, pull out those example requests, and then use them as actual tests just to make sure it did something reasonable, um, something approximating what those requests do.
uh, and what the documentation said they were going to do. Thanks. Okay. One more question, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. So it's a little bit surreal having absolutely no questions in this room where I can see people. I think everyone feels a lot safer if, if, uh, if I can't see them. Um, you mentioned about monitoring almost everything in your API. Yes. How do you do that without a noticeable performance hit? Uh, so there, there are lots of... Um, there are things that you can do to, to collect numbers just sort of alongside your normal... Um, the normal work, but things like um, StatsD from Etsy um, and then Graphite are really good, um, pretty low impact ways of uh, adding monitoring to your API. So StatsD, you can just push things at it very quickly. It uses UDP, so it's non-blocking, um, and it will then pass the information onto Graphite, which handles all the counting, the retention, and generates pretty graphs. Cheers. Anyone else? All right. I think that's it. That's it. I think that's it in here. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>